The Huns were a nomadic people who lived in Central Asia, the Caucasus, and Eastern Europe, between the 4th and 6th century AD. According to European tradition, they were first reported living east of the Volga River, in an area that was part of Scythia at the time. The Huns' arrival is associated with the migration westward of a Scythian people, the Alans. By 370 AD, the Huns had arrived on the Volga, and by 430 the Huns had established a vast, if short lived, dominion in Europe. In the 18th century, the French scholar Joseph de Guines became the first to propose a link between the Huns and the Xiongnu people, who were northern neighbors of China in the 3rd century BC. Since Guines' time, considerable scholarly effort has been devoted to investigating such a connection. However, there is no scholarly consensus on a direct connection between the dominant element of the Xiongnu and that of the Huns. Priscus, a 5th-century Roman diplomat and historian, mentions that the Huns had a language of their own, little of it has survived and scholars have considered whether it was related to Turkic, Mongolic, or even Tungusic language families, although the almost complete lack of a text corpus renders the language unclassifiable at present. Some researchers indeed argue, the original Huns may have had a Yenisean tribal elite, which ruled initially over various Turkic, Mongolic, and Iranian-speaking tribes. Numerous other ethnic groups were included under Attila the Huns' rule, including very many speakers of Gothic, which some modern scholars describe as a lingua franca of the empire. Their main military technique was mounted archery. The Huns may have stimulated the Great Migration, a contributing factor in the collapse of the Western Roman Empire. They formed a unified empire under Attila the Hun, who died in 453. After a defeat at the Battle of Nedao, their empire disintegrated over the next 15 years. Their descendants, or successors with similar names, are recorded by neighboring populations to the south, east, and west as having occupied parts of Eastern Europe and Central Asia from about the 4th to 6th centuries. Variants of the Hun name are recorded in the Caucasus until the early 8th century. The memory of the Huns also lived on in various Christian saints' lives, where the Huns play the roles of antagonists, as well as in Germanic heroic legend, where the Huns are variously antagonists or allies to the Germanic main figures. In Hungary, a legend developed based on medieval chronicles that the Hungarians, and the CK ethnic group in particular, are descended from the Huns. However, mainstream scholarship dismisses a close connection between the Hungarians and Huns. Topic. Origin The origins of the Huns and their links to other steppe people remain uncertain. Scholars generally agree that they originated in Central Asia but disagree on the specifics of their origins. Classical sources assert that they appeared in Europe suddenly around 370. Most typically, Roman writers' attempts to elucidate the origins of the Huns simply equated them with earlier steppe peoples. Roman writers also repeated a tale that the Huns had entered the domain of the Goths while they were pursuing a wild stag, or else one of their cows that had gotten loose, across the Kerch Strait into Crimea. Discovering the land good, they then attacked the Goths. Jordanes's Getica relates that the Goths held the Huns to be offspring of unclean spirits and Gothic witches. Topic. Relation to the Xiongnu and other peoples called Huns Since Joseph de Guines in the 18th century, modern historians have associated the Huns who appeared on the borders of Europe in the 4th century AD with the Xiongnu who had invaded China from the territory of present-day Mongolia between the 3rd century BC and the 2nd century AD. Due to the devastating defeat by the Chinese Han dynasty, the northern branch of the Xiongnu had retreated northwestward, their descendants may have migrated through Eurasia and consequently they may have some degree of cultural and genetic continuity with the Huns. Scholars also discussed the relationship between the Xiongnu, the Huns, and a number of people in Central Asia were also known as or came to be identified with the name Hun or Iranian Huns. The Chianites, the Kitarites, and the Hephthalites or White Huns being the most prominent. Otto J. Manchin Helfen was the first to challenge the traditional approach, based primarily on the study of written sources, and to emphasize the importance of archaeological research. Since Manchin Helfen's work, the identification of the Xiongnu as the Huns' ancestors has become controversial. Additionally, several scholars have questioned the identification of the Iranian Huns with the European Huns. Walter Pohl cautions that 
None of the great confederations of steppe warriors was ethnically homogeneous, and the same name was used by different groups for reasons of prestige, or by outsiders to describe their lifestyle or geographic origin. It is therefore futile to speculate about identity or blood relationships between H -S -I -U -N -G -NU, Hephthalites, and Attila's Huns, for instance. All we can safely say is that the name Huns, in late antiquity, described prestigious ruling groups of steppe warriors. Recent scholarship, particularly by Yun Jin Kim and Etienne de la Vicière, has revived the hypothesis that the Huns and the Xiongnu are one and the same. De la Vicière argues that ancient Chinese and Indian sources used Xiongnu and Hun to translate each other, and that the various Iranian Huns were similarly identified with the Xiongnu. Kim believes that the term Hun was not primarily an ethnic group, but a political category and argues for a fundamental political and cultural continuity between the Xiongnu and the European Huns, as well as between the Xiongnu and the Iranian Huns. <laughs> Race Ancient descriptions of the Huns are uniform in stressing their strange appearance from a Roman perspective. These descriptions typically caricature the Huns as monsters. Jordanes stressed that the Huns were short of stature and had tanned skin. Various writers mentioned that the Huns had small eyes and flat noses. The Roman writer Priscus gives the following eyewitness description of Attila. Short of stature, with a broad chest and a large head, his eyes were small, his beard thin and sprinkled with grey, and he had a flat nose and tanned skin, showing evidence of his origin. Many scholars take these to be unflattering depictions of East Asian. Mongoloid racial characteristics. Manchin Helfen argues that, while many Huns had some East Asian racial characteristics, they were unlikely to have looked as Asiatic as the Yakut or Tungus. He notes that archaeological finds of presumed Huns suggest that they were a racially mixed group containing only some individuals with East Asian features. Kim similarly cautions against seeing the Huns as a homogenous racial group, while still arguing that they were partially or predominantly of Mongoloid extraction, at least initially. Quote, Some archaeologists have argued that archaeological finds have failed to prove that the Huns had any Mongoloid features at all, and some scholars have argued that the Huns were predominantly Caucasian. Kim notes that at the Battle of Shalon, the vast majority of Attila's entourage and troops appears to have been European. History Before Attila The Romans became aware of the Huns when the latter's invasion of the Pontic steppes forced thousands of Goths to move to the lower Danube to seek refuge in the Roman Empire in 376. The Huns conquered the Alans, the Groithingi or Western Goths, and then the Thirvingi or Eastern Goths. In 395 the Huns began their first large-scale attack on the Eastern Roman Empire. Huns attacked in Thrace, overran Armenia, and pillaged Cappadocia. They entered parts of Syria, threatened Antioch, and passed through through the province of Euphrodesia. After this, the Huns invaded the Sassanid Empire. This invasion was initially successful, coming close to the capital of the empire at Cte Siphon. However, they were defeated badly during the Persian counterattack. During their brief diversion from the Eastern Roman Empire, the Huns may have threatened tribes further west. Uldin, the first Hun known by name, headed a group of Huns and Alans fighting against Radagasus in defense of Italy. Uldin was also known for defeating Gothic rebels giving trouble to the East Romans around the Danube and beheading the Goth Gainas around 400-401. The East Romans began to feel the pressure from Uldin's Huns again in 408. Uldin crossed the Danube and pillaged Thrace. The East Romans tried to buy Uldin off, but his sum was too high so they instead bought off Uldin's subordinates. This resulted in many desertions from Uldin's group of Huns. Hunnish mercenaries are mentioned on several occasions being employed by the East and West Romans, as well as the Goths, during the late 4th and 5th century. In 433 some parts of Pannonia were ceded to them by Flavius Aetius, the magister militum of the Western Roman Empire. <laughs> Under Attila From 434 the brothers Attila and Bleda ruled the Huns together. Attila and Bleda were as ambitious as their uncle Ruhila. 
In 435 they forced the Eastern Roman Empire to sign the Treaty of Margus, giving the Huns trade rights and an annual tribute from the Romans. When the Romans breached the treaty in 440, Attila and Bleda attacked Castra Constantius, a Roman fortress and marketplace on the banks of the Danube. War broke out between the Huns and Romans, and the Huns overcame a weak Roman army to raise the cities of Margus, Singidunum and Viminacium. Although a truce was concluded in 441, two years later Constantinople again failed to deliver the tribute and war resumed. In the following campaign, Hun armies approached Constantinople and sacked several cities before defeating the Romans at the Battle of Chersonesus. The Eastern Roman Emperor Theodosius II gave in to Hun demands and in autumn 443 signed the Peace of Anatolius with the two Hun kings. Bleda died in 445, and Attila became the sole ruler of the Huns. In 447, Attila invaded the Balkans and Thrace. The war came to an end in 449 with an agreement in which the Romans agreed to pay Attila an annual tribute of 2,100 pounds of gold. Throughout their raids on the Eastern Roman Empire, the Huns had maintained good relations with the Western Empire. However, in Honoria, sister of the Western Roman Emperor Valentinian III, sent Attila a ring and requested his help to escape her betrothal to a senator. Attila claimed her as his bride and half the Western Roman Empire as dowry. Additionally, a dispute arose about the rightful heir to a king of the Salian Franks. In 451, Attila's forces entered Gaul. Once in Gaul, the Huns first attacked Metz, then his armies continued westwards, passing both Paris and Troyes to lay siege to Orléans. Flavius Aetius was given the duty of relieving Orléans by Emperor Valentinian III. A combined army of Roman and Visigoths then defeated the Huns at the Battle of the Catalaunian Plains. The following year, Attila renewed his claims to Honoria and territory in the Western Roman Empire. Leading his army across the Alps and into northern Italy, he sacked and razed a number of cities. Hoping to avoid the sack of Rome, Emperor Valentinian III sent three envoys, the high civilian officers Gennadius Avianus and Trigesius, as well as Pope Leo I, who met Attila at Mincio in the vicinity of Mantua, and obtained from him the promise that he would withdraw from Italy and negotiate peace with the emperor. The new Eastern Roman Emperor Marcion then halted tribute payments, resulting in Attila planning to attack Constantinople. However, in 453 he died of a hemorrhage on his wedding night. After Attila After Attila's death in 453, the Hunnic Empire faced an internal power struggle between its vassalized Germanic peoples and the Hunnic ruling body. Led by Elek, Attila's favoured son and ruler of the Akatziri, the Huns engaged the Gepid king Arderic at the Battle of Nedau, who led a coalition of Germanic peoples to overthrow Hunnic imperial authority. The Amali Goths would revolt the same year under Valamir, allegedly defeating the Huns in a separate engagement. However, this did not result in the complete collapse of Hunnic power in the Carpathian region, but did result in the loss of many of their Germanic vassals. At the same time, the Huns were also dealing with the arrival of more Ogre Turkic speaking peoples from the east, including the Ogres, Saragors, Onogres, and the Sabirs. In 463, the Saragors defeated the Akatziri, or Akadir Huns, and asserted dominance in the Pontic region. The Western Huns under Dengzic experienced difficulties in 461, when they were defeated by Valamir in a war against the Sadiges, a people allied with the Huns. His campaigning was also met with dissatisfaction from Ernik, ruler of the Akatziri Huns, who wanted to focus on the incoming Ogre-speaking peoples. Dengzich attacked the Romans in 467, without the assistance of Ernik. He was surrounded by the Romans and besieged, and came to an agreement that they would surrender if they were given land and his starving forces given food. During the negotiations, a Hun in service of the Romans named Chelchil persuaded the enemy Goths to attack their Hun overlords. The Romans, under their general Aspar and with the help of his Bachelary, then attacked the quarreling Goths and Huns, defeating them. In 469, Denzigich was defeated and killed in Thrace. After Denzigich's death, the Huns seem to have been absorbed by other ethnic groups such as the Bulgars. Kim, however, argues that the Huns continued under Ernik, becoming the Kutrigur and Utigor Hunno Bulgars. This conclusion is still subject to some controversy. Some scholars also argue that another group identified in ancient sources as Huns, the North Caucasian Huns, were genuine Huns. 
The rulers of various post Hunnic steppe peoples are known to have claimed descent from Attila in order to legitimize their right to the power, and various steppe peoples were also called Huns by Western and Byzantine sources from the 4th century onward. Lifestyle and economy Pastoral nomadism The Huns have traditionally been described as pastoral nomads, living off of herding and moving from pasture to pasture to graze their animals. Yun Jin Kim, however, holds the term nomad to be misleading. T he term nomad, if it denotes a wandering group of people with no clear sense of territory, cannot be applied wholesale to the Huns. All the so-called nomads of Eurasian steppe history were peoples whose territory, territories were usually clearly defined, who as pastoralists moved about in search of pasture, but within a fixed territorial space. Manchin Helfen notes that pastoral nomads or semi-nomads typically alternate between summer pastures and winter quarters, while the pastures may vary, the winter quarters always remained the same. This is, in fact, what Jordanes writes of the Hunnic Altziagiri tribe, they pastured near Cherson on the Crimea and then wintered further north, with Manchin Helfen holding the Saivash as a likely location. Ancient sources mention that the Huns' herds consisted of various animals, including cattle, horses, and goats. Sheep, though unmentioned in ancient sources, are more essential to the steppe nomad even than horses, and must have been a large part of their herds. Additionally, Manchin Helfen argues that the Huns may have kept small herds of Bactrian camels in the part of their territory in modern Romania and Ukraine, something attested for the Sarmatians. Amianus says that the majority of the Huns' diet came from the meat of these animals, with Manchin Helfen arguing, on the basis of what is known of other steppe nomads, that they likely mostly ate mutton, along with sheep's cheese and milk. They also, certainly, ate horse meat, drank mare's milk, and likely made cheese and kumis. In times of starvation, they may have boiled their horses' blood for food. Ancient sources uniformly deny that the Huns practiced any sort of agriculture. Thompson, taking these accounts at their word, argues that, W. without the assistance of the settled agricultural population at the edge of the steppe, they could not have survived. He argues that the Huns were forced to supplement their diet by hunting and gathering. Manchin Helfen, however, notes that archaeological finds indicate that various steppe nomad populations did grow grain, in particular, he identifies a find at Cunha Uaz in Quersum on the Ob River of agriculture among a people who practiced artificial cranial deformation as evidence of Hunnic agriculture. Kim similarly argues that all steppe empires have possessed both pastoralist and sedentary populations, classifying the Huns as agro-pastoralist. Topic. Horses and transportation As a nomadic people, the Huns spent a great deal of time riding horses. Amianus claimed that the Huns are almost glued to their horses. Zosimus claimed that they live and sleep on their horses. And Sidonius claimed that S. Cars had an infant learn to stand without his mother's aid when a horse takes him on his back. They appear to have spent so much time riding that they walked clumsily, something observed in other nomadic groups. Roman sources characterize the Hunnic horses as ugly. It is not possible to determine the exact breed of horse the Huns used, despite relatively good Roman descriptions. Siner believes that it was likely a breed of Mongolian pony. However, horse remains are absent from all identified Hun burials. Based on anthropological descriptions and archaeological finds of other nomadic horses, Manchin Helfen believes that they rode mostly geldings. Besides horses, ancient sources mention that the Huns used wagons for transportation, which Manchin Helfen believes were primarily used to transport their tents, booty, and the old people, women, and children. Topic: <laughs> Economic relations with the Romans. The Huns received a large amount of gold from the Romans, either in exchange for fighting for them as mercenaries or as tribute. Raiding and looting also furnished the Huns with gold and other valuables. Civilians and soldiers captured by the Huns might also be ransomed back, or else sold to Roman slave dealers as slaves. The Huns themselves, Manchin Helfen argues, had little use for slaves due to their nomadic pastoralist lifestyle. Those slaves that existed likely performed menial tasks. Thompson argues that all Hunnic slaves appear to have been captives from war. The Huns also traded with the Romans. 
E. A. Thompson argued that this trade was very large scale, with the Huns trading horses, furs, meat, and slaves for Roman weapons, linen, and grain, and various other luxury goods. While Manchin Helfen concedes that the Huns traded their horses for what he considered to have been a very considerable source of income in gold, he is otherwise skeptical of Thompson's argument. He notes that the Romans strictly regulated trade with the barbarians and that, according to Priscus, trade only occurred at a fair once a year. While he notes that smuggling also likely occurred, he argues that the volume of both legal and illegal trade was apparently modest. He does note that wine and silk appear to have been imported into the Hunnic Empire in large quantities, however. Roman gold coins appear to have been in circulation as currency within the whole of the Hunnic Empire. Topic. Government Hunnic governmental structure has long been debated. Peter Heather argues that the Huns were a disorganized confederation in which leaders acted completely independently and that eventually established a ranking hierarchy, much like Germanic societies. Dennis Siner similarly notes that, with the exception of the historically uncertain Balamer, no Hun leaders are named in the sources until Uldin, indicating their relative unimportance. Thompson argues that permanent kingship only developed with the Huns' invasion of Europe and the near-constant warfare that followed. Regarding the organization of Hunnic rule under Attila, Peter Golden comments, "...it can hardly be called a state, much less an empire." Golden speaks instead of a "...Hunnic confederacy." Kim, however, argues that the Huns continued the Xiongnu state organization, in which their polity was divided into left, right, south, and north, in that order of priority. Kim argues that the Huns continued the council of six horns, nobles, that the Xiongnu had under their emperor. Likewise, Kim suggests that the Huns continued to use the decimal military organization of the Xiongnu as well. Ammianus said that the Huns of his day had no kings, but rather that each group of Huns instead had a group of leading men primates for times of war, e.a. Thompson supposes that even in war the leading men had little actual power. He further argues that they most likely did not acquire their position purely hereditarily. Heather, however, argues that Ammianus merely means that the Huns didn't have a single ruler. He notes that Olympiodorus mentions the Huns having several kings, with one being the first of the kings. Ammianus also mentions that the Huns made their decisions in a general council omnes in commune while seated on horse back. He makes no mention of the Huns' organization into tribes, but Priscus and other writers do, naming some of them, the first Hunnic ruler known by name as Uldin. Thompson takes Uldin's sudden disappearance after he was unsuccessful at war as a sign that the Hunnic kingship was democratic at this time rather than a permanent institution. Kim however argues that Uldin is actually a title and that he was likely merely a subking. Priscus calls Attila king or emperor. Basileis but it is unknown what native title he was translating. With the exception of the sole rule of Attila, the Huns often had two rulers, Attila himself later appointed his son Elak as co-king. Subject peoples of the Huns were led by their own kings, Priscus also speaks of picked men, or logades, logades forming part of Attila's government, naming five of them. Some of the picked men seem to have been chosen because of birth, others for reasons of merit. Thompson argued that these picked men, were the hinge upon which the entire administration of the Hun Empire turned. He argues for their existence in the government of Uldin, and that each had command over detachments of the Hunnic army and ruled over specific portions of the Hunnic Empire, where they were responsible also for collecting tribute and provisions. Manchin Helfen, however, argues that the word logades denotes simply prominent individuals and not a fixed rank with fixed duties. Kim affirms the importance of the Logades for Hunnic administration, but notes that there were differences of rank between them, and suggests that it was more likely lower-ranking officials who gathered taxes and tribute. He suggests that various Roman defectors to the Huns may have worked in a sort of imperial bureaucracy. Topic. Society and culture Topic. Art and material culture There are two sources for the material culture and art of the Huns, ancient descriptions and archaeology. Unfortunately, the nomadic nature of Hun society means that they have left very little in the archaeological record. 
It can be difficult to distinguish Hunnic archaeological finds from those of the Sarmatians, as both peoples lived in close proximity and seem to have had very similar material cultures. Kim thus cautions that it is difficult to assign any artifact to the Huns ethnically. Roman descriptions of the Huns, meanwhile, are often highly biased, stressing their supposed primitiveness. Archaeological finds have produced a large number of cauldrons that have since the work of Paul Reinach in 1896 been identified as having been produced by the Huns. Although typically described as bronze cauldrons, the cauldrons are often made of copper, which is generally of poor quality. Manchin Helfen lists 19 known finds of Hunnish cauldrons from all over Central and Eastern Europe and Western Siberia. He argues from the state of the bronze castings that the Huns were not very good metalsmiths, and that it is likely that the cauldrons were cast in the same locations where they were found. They come in various shapes, and are sometimes found together with vessels of various other origins. Manchin Helfen argues that the cauldrons were cooking vessels for boiling meat, but that the fact that many are found deposited near water and were generally not buried with individuals may indicate a sacral usage as well. The cauldrons appear to derive from those used by the Xiongnu. Ammianus also reports that the Huns had iron swords. Thompson is skeptical that the Huns cast them themselves, but Manchin Helfen argues that T he idea that the Hun horsemen fought their way to the walls of Constantinople and to the Marne with bartered and captured swords is absurd. Both ancient sources and archaeological finds from graves confirm that the Huns wore elaborately decorated golden or gold-plated diadems. Manchin Helfen lists a total of six known Hunnish diadems. Hunnic women seem to have worn necklaces and bracelets of mostly imported beads of various materials as well. The later common early medieval practice of decorating jewelry and weapons with gemstones appears to have originated with the Huns. They are also known to have made small mirrors of an originally Chinese type, which often appear to have been intentional broken when placed into a grave. Archaeological finds indicate that the Huns wore gold plaques as ornaments on their clothing, as well as imported glass beads. Ammianus reports that they wore clothes made of linen or the furs of marmots and leggings of goatskin. Ammianus reports that the Huns had no buildings, but in passing mentions that the Huns possessed tents and wagons. Manchin Helfen believes that the Huns likely had tents of felt and sheepskin. Priscus once mentions Attila's tent, and Jordanes reports that Attila lay in state in a silk tent. However, by the middle of the 5th century, the Huns are also known to have also owned permanent wooden houses, which Manchin Helfen believes were built by their Gothic subjects. Topic: <laughs> Artificial cranial deformation. Artificial cranial deformation was practiced by the Huns and sometimes by tribes under their influence. Artificial cranial deformation of the circular type can be used to trace the route that the Huns took from North China to the Central Asian steppes and subsequently to the Southern Russian steppes. The people who practiced annular type artificial cranial deformation in Central Asia were Yuzi, Kushans. Some artificially deformed crania from the 5th 6th century AD have been found in northeastern Hungary and elsewhere in Western Europe. None of them have any mongoloid features and all the skulls appear europoid. These skulls may have belonged to Germanic or other subject groups whose parents wish to elevate their status by following a custom introduced by the Huns. Topic: <laughs> Languages. A variety of languages were spoken within the Hun Empire. Priscus noted that the Hunnic language differed from other languages spoken at Attila's court. He recounts how Attila's jester Zerko made Attila's guests laugh also by the promiscuous jumble of words, Latin mixed with Hunnish and Gothic. Priscus said that Attila's Scythian subjects spoke, besides their own barbarian tongues, either Hunnish, or Gothic, or, as many have dealings with the Western Romans, Latin, but not one of them easily speaks Greek, except captives from the Thracian or Illyrian frontier regions. Some scholars have argued that the Gothic was used as the lingua franca of the Hunnic Empire. Yun Jin Kim argues that the Huns may have used as many as four languages at various levels of government, without any one being dominant Hunnic, Gothic, Latin, and Sarmatian. As to the Hunnic language itself, only three words are recorded in ancient sources as being Hunnic, all of which appear to be from an Indo European language. All other information on Hunnic is contained in personal names and tribal ethnonyms. On the basis of these names, scholars have proposed that Hunnic may have been a Turkic language, a language between Mongolic and Turkic, or a Yenisean language. 
However, given the small corpus, many scholars hold the language to be unclassifiable. Topic: Religion. Almost nothing is known about the religion of the Huns. Roman writer Ammianus Marcellinus claimed that the Huns had no religion, while the 5th century Christian writer Salvian classified them as pagans. Jordanes's Getica also records that the Huns worshipped the Sword of Mars, an ancient sword that signified Attila's right to rule the whole world. Manchin Helfen notes a widespread worship of a war god in the form of a sword among steppe peoples, including among the Xiongnu. Dennis Siner, however, holds the worship of a sword among the Huns to be apocryphal. Manchin Helfen also argues that, while the Huns themselves do not appear to have regarded Attila as divine, some of his subject people clearly did. A belief in prophecy and divination is also attested among the Huns. Manchin Helfen argues that the performers of these acts of soothsaying and divination were likely shamans. Siner also finds it likely that the Huns had shamans, although they are completely unattested. Manchin Helfen also deduces a belief in water spirits from a custom mentioned in Ammianus. He further suggests that the Huns may have made small metal, wooden, or stone idols, which are attested among other steppe tribes, and which a Byzantine source attests for the Huns in Crimea in the 6th century. He also connects archaeological finds of Hunnish bronze cauldrons found buried near or in running water to possible rituals performed by the Huns in the spring. John Mann argues that the Huns of Attila's time likely worshipped the sky and the steppe deity Tengri, who is also attested as having been worshipped by the Xiongnu. Manchin Helfen also suggests the possibility that the Huns of this period may have worshipped Tengri, but notes that the god is not attested in European records until the 9th century. Worship of Tengri under the name Tangri Khan is attested among the Caucasian Huns in the Armenian chronicle attributed to Movses Daskshirancy during the later 7th century. Movses also records that the Caucasian Huns worshipped trees and burnt horses as sacrifices to Tengri, and that they made sacrifices to fire and water and to certain gods of the roads, and to the moon and to all creatures considered in their eyes to be in some way remarkable. There is also some evidence for human sacrifice among the European Huns. Manchin Helfen argues that humans appear to have been sacrificed at Attila's funerary rite, recorded in Jordanes under the name Strava. Priscus claims that the Huns sacrificed their prisoners to victory after they entered Scythia, but this is not otherwise attested as a Hunnic custom and may be fiction. In addition to these pagan beliefs, there are numerous attestations of Huns converting to Christianity and receiving Christian missionaries. The missionary activities among the Huns of the Caucasus seem to have been particularly successful, resulting in the conversion of the Hunnish prince Alp Iltber. Attila appears to have tolerated both Nicene and Aryan Christianity among his subjects. Warfare Strategy and tactics Hun warfare as a whole is not well studied, and many scholars as of recent have discounted Ammianus' description of the Huns. While Ammianus claims that the Huns knew no metalworking, Manchin Helfen argues that a people so primitive could never have been successful in war against the Romans. A major source of information on Hun warfare comes from the 6th century Strategicon, which describes the warfare of dealing with the Scythians, that is, Avars, Turks, and others whose way of life resembles that of the Hunnish peoples. The Strategicon describes the Avars and Huns as devious and very experienced in military matters. They are described as preferring to defeat their enemies by deceit, surprise attacks, and cutting off supplies. The Huns brought large numbers of horses to use as replacements and to give the impression of a larger army on campaign. The Hunnish peoples did not set up an entrenched camp, but spread out across the grazing fields according to clan, and guard their necessary horses until they began forming the battle line under the cover of early morning. The Strategicon states the Huns also stationed sentries at significant distances and in constant contact with each other in order to prevent surprise attacks. According to the Strategicon, the Huns did not form a battle line in the method that the Romans and Persians used, but in irregularly sized divisions in a single line, and keep a separate force nearby for ambushes and as a reserve. 
The Strategikon also states the Huns used deep formations with a dense and even front. Otto Manchin Helfen states that the Huns likely formed up in divisions according to tribal clans and families, which Ammianus calls Cunae, the leader of which was called a Kur and inherited the title as it was passed down through the clan. The Strategikon states that the Huns kept their spare horses and baggage train to either side of the line about a mile away, with a moderate sized guard, and would sometimes tie their spare horses together behind the main battle line. The Huns preferred to fight at long range, utilizing ambush, encirclement, and the feigned retreat. The Strategikon also makes note of the wedge-shaped formations mentioned by Ammianus, and corroborated as familial regiments by Manchin Helfen. The Strategikon states the Huns preferred to pursue their enemies relentlessly after a victory and then wear them out by a long siege after defeat. Peter Heather notes that the Huns were able to successfully besiege walled cities and fortresses in their campaign of 441, they were thus capable of building siege engines. While Heather believes that this was likely a newly acquired skill, he notes that the Huns, as potential descendants of the Xiongnu, may have already known how to make siege equipment before entering Europe. Topic. Military equipment The Strategikon states the Huns typically used mail, swords, bows, and lances, and that most Hunnic warriors were armed with both the bow and lance and used them interchangeably as needed. It also states the Huns used quilted linen, wool, or sometimes iron barding for their horses and also wore quilted coifs and caftans. This assessment is largely corroborated by archaeological finds of Hun military equipment, such as the Volnikovka and Brute burials. A late Roman ridge helmet of the Burkosovo type was found with a Hun burial at Concesti. A Hunnic helmet of the Segmentahelm type was found at Chujaski, a Hunnic Spangin helmet at Terezovsky Grave 1784, and another of the Bandhelm type at Turivo. Fragments of lamellar helmets dating to the Hunnic period and within the Hunnic sphere have been found at Iatris, Ilichevka, and Kalkni. Hun lamellar armor has not been found in Europe, although two fragments of likely Hun origin have been found on the Upper Obe and in West Kazakhstan dating to the 3rd-4th centuries. A find of lamellar dating to about 520 from the Toprichioi warehouse in the fortress of Halmiris near Badabag, Romania, suggests a late 5th or early 6th century introduction. It is known that the Eurasian Avars introduced lamellar armor to the Roman army and migration era Germanics in the middle 6th century, but this later type does not appear before then. It is also widely accepted that the Huns introduced the Langzeix, a 60 cm cutting blade that became popular among the migration era Germanics and in the late Roman army, into Europe. It is believed these blades originated in China and that the Sarmatians and Huns served as a transmission vector, using shorter sea axes in Central Asia that developed into the narrow Langzeix in Eastern Europe during the late 4th and first half of the 5th century. These earlier blades date as far back as the 1st century AD, with the first of the newer type appearing in Eastern Europe being the Wien Simmerming example, dated to the late 4th century AD. Other notable Hun examples include the Langzeix from the more recent find at Volnikovka in Russia. The Huns used a type of spatha in the Iranic or Sassanid style, with a long, straight approximately 83 cm blade, usually with a diamond-shaped iron guard plate. Swords of this style have been found at sites such as Altlisheim, Zermabesenyo, Volnikovka, Novo Ivanovka, and Sibilium 61. They typically had gold foil hilts, gold sheet scabbards, and scabbard fittings decorated in the polychrome style. The sword was carried in the Iranian style, attached to a sword belt, rather than on a baldric. The most famous weapon of the Huns is the Kum Darya type composite recurve bow, often called the Hunnish bow. This bow was invented some time in the 3rd or 2nd centuries BC with the earliest finds near Lake Baikal, but spread across Eurasia long before the Hunnic migration. These bows were typified by being asymmetric in cross-section between 145 to 155 cm in length, having between 4 to 9 lathes on the grip and in the seas. Although whole bows rarely survive in European climatic conditions, finds of bone seas are quite common and characteristic of steppe burials. Complete specimens have been found at sites in the Tarim Basin and Gobi Desert such as Nia, Kum Darya, and Shambuzin Belkir. Eurasian nomads such as the Huns typically used trilobate diamond-shaped iron arrowheads, attached using birch tar and a tang, with typically 75 cm shafts and fletching attached with tar and sinew whipping. Such trilobate arrowheads are believed to be more accurate and have better penetrating power or capacity to injure than flat arrowheads. 
Topic Legacy. Topic In Christian hagiography. After the fall of the Hunnic Empire, various legends arose concerning the Huns. Among these are a number of Christian hagiographic legends in which the Huns play a role. In an anonymous medieval biography of Pope Leo I, Attila's march into Italy in 452 is stopped because, when he meets Leo outside Rome, the apostles Peter and Paul appear to him holding swords over his head and threatening to kill him unless he follows the Pope's command to turn back. In other versions, Attila takes the Pope hostage and is forced by the saints to release him. In the legend of Saint Ursula, Ursula and her 11,000 holy virgins arrive at Cologne on their way back from a pilgrimage just as the Huns, under an unnamed prince, are besieging the city. Ursula and her virgins killed by the Huns with arrows after they refused the Huns' sexual advances. Afterwards, however, the souls of the slaughtered virgins form a heavenly army that drives away the Huns and saves Cologne. Other cities with legends regarding the Huns and a saint include Orleans, Troyes, Duse, Metz, Modena, and Reims. In legends surrounding Saint Servatius of Tongeren dating to at least the 8th century, Servatius is said to have converted Attila and the Huns to Christianity, before they later became apostates and returned to their paganism. In Germanic legend The Huns also play an important role in medieval Germanic legends, which frequently convey versions of events from the migration period and were originally transmitted orally. Memories of the conflicts between the Goths and Huns in Eastern Europe appear to be maintained in the Old English poem Widsith as well as in Old Norse poem, The Battle of the Goths and Huns, which is transmitted in the 13th century Icelandic Hervarar saga. Widsith also mentions Attila having been ruler of the Huns, placing him at the head of a list of various legendary and historical rulers and peoples and marking the Huns as the most famous. The name Attila, rendered in Old English as Aitla, was a given name in use in Anglo-Saxon England X. Bishop Aitla of Dorchester and its use in England at the time may have been connected to the heroic king's legend represented in works such as Widsith. Mainchen Helfen, however, doubts the use of the name by the Anglo-Saxons had anything to do with the Huns, arguing that it was not a rare name. Bede, in his Ecclesiastical History of the English People, lists the Huns among other peoples living in Germany when the Anglo-Saxons invaded England. This may indicate that Bede viewed the Anglo-Saxons as descending partially from the Huns. The Huns and Attila also form central figures in the two most widespread Germanic legendary cycles, that of the Nibelings and of Dietrich von Bern, the historical Theodoric the Great. The Nibling legend, particularly as recorded in the Old Norse poetic Edda and Volsunga saga, as well as in the German Nibelungenlied, connects the Huns and Attila, and in the Norse tradition, Attila's death to the destruction of the Burgundian kingdom on the Rhine in 437. In the legends about Dietrich von Bern, Attila and the Huns provide Dietrich with a refuge and support after he has been driven from his kingdom at Verona. A version of the events of the Battle of Nidau may be perserved in a legend, transmitted in two differing versions in the Middle High German Die Rebenschlacht and Old Norse Thidrexaga, in which the sons of Attila fall in battle. The legend of Walter of Aquitaine, meanwhile, shows the Huns to receive child hostages as tribute from their subject peoples. Generally, the continental Germanic traditions paint a more positive picture of Attila and the Huns than the Scandinavian sources, where the Huns appear in a distinctly negative light. In medieval German legend, the Huns were identified with the Hungarians, with their capital of Etzelberg Attila city being identified with Estergom or Buda. The Old Norse Thidrexaga, however, which is based on North German sources, locates Hunaland in northern Germany, with a capital at Soest in Westphalia. In other Old Norse sources, the term Hun is sometimes applied indiscriminately to various people, particularly from south of Scandinavia. From the 13th century onward, the Middle High German word for Hun, Hyun, became a synonym for giant, and continued to be used in this meaning in the forms Hun and Hun into the modern era. In this way, various prehistoric megalithic structures, particularly in northern Germany, came to be identified as Hunengraber Hun graves, or Hunenbetten Hun beds. Topic. Links to the Hungarians Beginning in the High Middle Ages, Hungarian sources have claimed descent from or a close relationship between the Hungarians Magyars and the Huns. The claim appears to have first arisen in non-Hungarian sources and only gradually been taken up by the Hungarians themselves because of its negative connotations. 
The anonymous Gesta Hungarorum after 1200 is the first Hungarian source to mention that the line of Arpadian kings were descendants of Attila, but he makes no claim that the Hungarian and Hun peoples are related. The first Hungarian author to claim that Hun and Hungarian peoples were related was Simon of Kaza in his Gesta Hunorum et Hungarorum Simon claimed that the Huns and Hungarians were descended from two brothers, named Hunor and Magar. These claims gave the Hungarians an ancient pedigree and served to legitimize their conquest of Pannonia. Modern scholars largely dismiss these claims. Regarding the claimed Hunnish origins found in these chronicles, Geno Such writes, The Hunnish origin of the Magyars is, of course, a fiction, just like the Trojan origin of the French or any of the other Origo Gentis theories fabricated at much the same time. The Magyars in fact originated from the Ugrian branch of the Finno-Ugrian peoples, in the course of their wanderings in the steppes of Eastern Europe they assimilated a variety of especially Iranian and different Turkic cultural and ethnic elements, but they had neither genetic nor historical links to the Huns. Generally, the proof of the relationship between the Hungarian and the Finno-Ugric languages in the 19th century is taken to have scientifically disproven the Hunnic origins of the Hungarians. Another claim, also derived from Simon of Kaza, is that the Hungarian-speaking CK people of Transylvania are descended from Huns, who fled to Transylvania after Attila's death, and remained there until the Hungarian conquest of Pannonia. While the origins of the CK are unclear, modern scholarship is skeptical that they are related to the Huns. Unlike in the legend, the CK were resettled in Transylvania from western Hungary in the 11th century. Their language similarly shows no evidence of a change from any non-Hungarian language to Hungarian, as one would expect if they were Huns. While the Hungarians and the Sikes may not be descendants of the Huns, they were historically closely associated with Turkic peoples. Paul Engel notes that it cannot be wholly excluded that Arpadian kings may have been descended from Attila, however, and believes that it is likely the Hungarians once lived under the rule of the Huns. Yun Jin Kim supposes that the Hungarians might be linked to the Huns via the Bulgars and Avars, both of whom he holds to have had Hunnish elements. However, there is no genetic or linguistic evidence supporting a connection between ancient or modern Hungarians and the Huns, while the notion that the Hungarians are descended from the Huns has been rejected by mainstream scholarship, the idea has continued to exert a relevant influence on Hungarian nationalism and national identity. A majority of the Hungarian aristocracy continued to ascribe to the Hunnic view into the early 20th century. The fascist Aero Cross Party similarly referred to Hungary as Hunnia in its propaganda. Hunnic origins also played a large role in the ideology of the modern radical right-wing party Jobbik's ideology of pan-Turanism. Legends concerning the Hunnic origins of the CK minority in Romania, meanwhile, continue to play a large role in that group's ethnic identity. The Hunnish origin of the CKs remains the most widespread theory of their origins among the Hungarian general public. 20th century use in reference to Germans On 27 July 1900, during the Boxer Rebellion in China, Kaiser Wilhelm II of Germany gave the order to act ruthlessly towards the rebels. Mercy will not be shown, prisoners will not be taken. Just as a thousand years ago, the Huns under Attila won a reputation of might that lives on in legends, so may the name of Germany in China, such that no Chinese will even again dare so much as to look askance at a German." This comparison was later heavily employed by British and English language propaganda during World War I, and to a lesser extent during World War II, in order to paint the Germans as savage barbarians. See also List of rulers of the Huns Nomadic Empire Topic Notes Topic References Topic Further reading Attila und die Hunnen Begleitbuch zur Ostellung. HRSG, VOM Historischen Museum der Fals, Speyer. Stuttgart 2007. Christopher Kelly, Attila the Hun, Barbarian Terror and the Fall of the Roman Empire London 2008. Rudy Paul Lindner, Nomadism, Horses and Huns, in, Past and Present 92, 1981, p. 3-19. 
Franz Altheim, Attila und die Hunnen J. Werner, Beatrice zur Archäologie des Attila Reiches W. M. McGovern, Early Empires of Central Asia Frederick John Tegert, China and Rome R. E. P. R. 1983 External links Dornike, Chris M. 2008. Chinese Sources on the History of the Niu Si Wu Si A Si Oi Rishi Ka Arsi Arshi Ruzi and their Kuishang Kushan Dynasty. Shiji 110, Hanshu 94a, The Zongnu, Synopsis of Chinese Original Text and several Western translations with extant annotations. A blog on Central Asian History. Huns. Encyclopædia Britannica 11th ed., 1911.